Everybody and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. And okay, I can't. <sighs> Board Game Breakfast is a little late this week, obviously, because we were at the Essen Spiel Fair this past week. Huge, huge convention in Germany. Uh, we were there, <laughs> felt, felt like we were working 24 hours. Not quite. But I got to see a ton of games. We have so many games that are coming our way. Honestly, there's no way we're going to even be able to talk about them all. But hopefully we're going to be able to talk about a lot of them. And we'll talk a little bit about the fair itself. But we move on. So we're in November, starting tomorrow anyway. And in November, what's going on? Well, first of all, PAX Unplugged is coming up in a couple weeks. If you look at the schedule for PAX Unplugged, me, Sam, and Z are doing a top 10 there. I'm also on a panel on the, about the future of board games and what will happen with that. So that will be interesting. So those are two things that we'll be involved with there. We'll also have a booth there that with Geek & Sun. Geek & Sun with the tables. We're going to have a, a, a one of the spots at their booth. We'll have some pins and some other promos that you can come by and grab those. So hopefully that will work well for you guys. We hope to see many of you there. Okay, beyond that, the, the after that, uh, there's going to be Thanksgiving here, uh, in, Amer in America at least, and then the Dice Tower Cruise. We got our Christmas uh, shopping lists coming up, our best of the year stuff is coming up, so there's really a lot going on. And right now, I mentioned this a little bit last week, but it's actually happening, the Dice Tower or I'm sorry, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund Auction. The Jack Vassal Memorial Fund Auction is a huge auction on Board Game Geek. There's a geek list there where you can put up all sorts of things and bid on different things. There is amazing stuff there. People have done some amazing things, and it helps out other people in the online board gaming community. So if you have a chance, you can post things to that, put items up for yourself for auction, or bid on other people's items, or just spread the word. I'd really appreciate that. Okay, let's get to the news. Okay, so first of all, Fantasy Flight Games has announced with Asmodee Digital, they're doing Fantasy Flight Interactive. Now, this is going to be uh, basically games that they, you know, we're already seeing board games as computer games, video games, apps, and so on. But it's also going to focus on actual video games. I don't really know what the hell that means. I think we'll learn more as time goes by. But that's intriguing. Fantasy Flight just continuing to grow. Does this mean, though, like we'll see an Arkham Horror video game who knows um asmodee has a new logo um which yay most boring logo for a big company in a long time but it, it, it's clean looking at least pax unplugged i mentioned that at the beginning but they have posted their schedule of all their different events and that's coming up very soon so keep an eye out for that renegade has announced they're going to be printing by zans this is an auction card game so you'll see this next year we're going to see an overhaul of Eclipse. Now, this is one that I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are really excited about. Um, there's going to be, they're going to be remaking the minis, custom dice, a complete overhaul of the graphics. I don't know how much of the gameplay they're changing. Eclipse was a huge hit when it came out. I haven't heard as much about it in recent years, the last year or so, but I know a lot of people still love the game and I'm, they're pretty excited about it. When I was at Essen, I had a chance to go to the Ravensburger event there, and there was a couple things of note. First of all, uh, Reiner Canizia spoke for a while because he was talking about the race to El Dorado and um, how essentially that game was, uh, it was nominated for Spiel des Jahres, didn't, didn't win, but it still was a big deal to be nominated. And he talked about how they're going to be making expansions for it and maybe another game kind of following after it. It wasn't very clear, but there's more plans for that game. But the biggest announcement that that Ravensburger made was the rise of Queensdale. Now, this is a game from Inca and Marcus Brandt. You know them because they've done so many great things like the, the escape games. I mean, they're just great, great designers. 
and this is a legacy game. So that's intriguing. It's another Euro game style legacy game. They said something like there'll be like 20 games within the box and everything. So very curious to see how this one will turn out. Pretty pumped about it. It's a big giant box. It's part of the Aaliyah line. Aaliyah is back. Uh, that's one of Ravensburger's lines of games. You know, a lot of the games from that line, like Puerto Rico and things like that, just was a big deal. Um, this is a looks like a new size in that line, so we'll have to see where this leads. There's a lot of other news that we're going to find out as time goes by, especially coming out of the Essen Fair. But that's it for now. Let's get to Suzanne. Happy breakfast, everybody. I'm actually recording this a lot earlier than I normally would because the week that I normally would be recording this, I'll be in Essen. So hopefully this will all come together okay. But I definitely have a few crowdfunding projects to take a look at. So let's get going. Tabula Rasa is a pool building game about fighting off monsters in a mythical land called Tabulet. Mechanically, the game is straightforward from a pool building point of view, with players using crystals to activate abilities, different crystals aligning to different abilities. You can always create specific crystals by discarding any other two, and you'll be moving around the board, revealing rewards and battling foes, which you know the difficulty of, but not quite the specifics of until you get there. You'll work to fulfill quest cards, gaining equipment, and crafting your pool, and each round you'll have to deal with a challenge from the threat deck. Its impact is based on the space your character is on on the board. A basic copy of Tabula Rasa takes a pledge of $39 plus shipping. Going for kind of a Halloween theme for the rest of our projects, Haunt the House is a family game in which players are ghosts trying to scare ghost hunters out of the house. If this cute game catches your eye, you need to act fast because this campaign ends November 2nd. Rooms are laid out and ghost hunters assigned to them at random. Each player gets a scare deck of their own and you'll be playing the scare cards to rooms, ultimately trying to get the right scare symbols. You can play a card to a room face down to mask your plans, or you can place them face up which lets you use the room's superpower, but it also reveals information to the opponents. If you successfully scare away the ghost hunter, you get point tokens or you can earn a phantom card that gives you special powers. Haunt the House has charming art and a fun theme, and you can get a copy for $29 Canadian dollars plus shipping. Monsterlands is a worker placement and dice battling game in which you control a clan that has been contracted to fight off monsters and free the Queen's lands. Dice are generated based on your game status, and you use these dice to take actions like gaining equipment, mercenaries, and upgrading your clan. After you've used your dice to prepare for the battle, you use the dice to fight off the monsters. Resources allow you to manipulate the dice, and it seems like strategic resource management to control your dice is really key to this game. As you conquer monsters or gain back lands, you'll earn rewards that let you further improve your clan. Monsterlands has a lot going on and a lot of stuff in the box, especially at the deluxe level that replaces cardboard with wood bits and it includes custom dice. A basic copy of Monsterlands takes a pledge of 54 euro, or that deluxe monster edition, you can get that for 84 euro. And finally, Carnival of Monsters represents well-known publisher Amigo's first foray into the crowdfunding world. A card game designed by Richard Garfield, Carnival of Monsters has an ambitious campaign goal that seems largely focused on ensuring the game has premier quality art from well-known fantasy artists. The game itself is about displaying your carnival to earn fame through a combination of drafting and set collection. You'll use land cards to play monsters and can match monsters to seasons for extra points. Staff cards provide a wide range of ongoing bonuses for your carnival, while events will give you a one-time boost. And secret goals help add variety to the player's strategies. Uncommon in drafting games is also the ability to save a card for later play, but you have to pay for it. There is a deluxe edition featuring metal coins, or you can get the standard game of Carnival of Monsters for 45 euro plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And if I'm doing my math right, this airs the day I'm on a plane back from Germany. So, hey, if I met you at Essen, it was nice to meet you. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hello. 
Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, starting off the week with another installment of Board Games Throughout History, where we look at games that are very, very old. In fact, today's game is so old that nobody actually knows the real way to play it. But more on that in a bit. First, let me introduce you to the ancient Egyptian game Senate. Suggested by viewer Ben Von Brandt. Board Games Throughout History Now, Senate is an ancient Egyptian board game similar, in some respect, to Backgammon. Each of the game's two players have five pawns which make their way around a track of 30 spaces, which is split into three rows of 10 spaces. Instead of dice, the pawn's serpentine movement around the track is determined instead by the throw of four sticks, which are black on one side and white on the other. It's believed that the object of the game is to be for a player to be the first one to move all of their pawns off the other side of the board. Now, whether or not that's actually correct appears to be uncertain, because Senate diminished in popularity over the course of several thousand years, and only a few scarce fragments of documentation recording the game's rules have been discovered. It's possible that nobody has known how to actually play this game since Egypt had a pharaoh. Spooky. And while modern gamers have cobbled together a somewhat comprehensive version of Senate's rules, it's still just an educated guess. Portions of the game's rules have been found in numerous ancient excavation sites as well as in Cyprus, and descriptions of Senate are also depicted in various Egyptian hieroglyphs and paintings. But none of these descriptions of the game are complete. And because of this, there's still some skepticism as to whether or not we actually know how to play Senate. Some of the biggest strides in resurrecting Senate have been made by Senate historians Timothy Kendall and R.C. Bell, because a Senate historian is apparently a profession that you can be. But even so, the rule set that they came up with is based just on snippets of various documents spanning over a thousand years. And since the game likely morphed and evolved over the centuries, well, it's unlikely that their rules are in fact indicative of the actual original game played in ancient Egypt. Which makes Senate a sort of a Theseus's paradox of the board game world. A paradox that we'll start to piece together a little bit more next time. So what's happening from the Dice Tower this week? So what's happening from the Dice Tower this week? I don't think this looks much better either. So, because we just got back from the Essen Fair, you're not going to see as many reviews this week because there's just a lot going on, but we should have some stuff for you. First of all, Jason interviewed a lot of people at the Essen Fair, so you're going to see the rest of those interviews. Uh, some are going up today, tomorrow, and so on. I did walkthroughs of all the halls of Essen. I wanted you to see the kind of have the whole experience if you've never gone before. So you'll see those being posted this week. Um, the People's Choice Top 100 of all times. So we're going to sit and talk about that a little bit. And you might, like I said, see a review or two. I'm not going to tell you which ones though because I'm not quite sure. We also did a live show at Essen itself that normally goes up today, which is Tuesday. Slightly delayed, again, because of us traveling and such. That will go up soon. We have an audio and video version of that show. If you did come to that show, we really appreciate it, and thank you very much. Let's move on. Ahoy, everyone. My name is Annette the Pirate, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of St. Malo. So St. Malo is a roll and write game where you're trying to develop your city by building markets, houses, churches, and especially walls, because those walls will protect you against pirates. So let me show you a little bit about the game and why I like it. In the game of St. Malo, every player will have their own player board along with their marker that will be a central playing board and only five dice in the game. On your roll, you're going to take all five dice and roll them. Once you roll, you go ahead and pick and choose what you like to keep. You can even re-roll them all, but you only get up to three re-rolls. If this is my final outcome, then I could draw two walls anywhere along the edge of my map, like I did so right here. With these two green heads, I can pick and choose what I would like. For example, I can pick two citizens, or I can pick either one soldier and one priest, which will give me either defense or victory points in the game. 
If you roll any one of these cross swords, then you will go ahead and check off one of the boxes here. Once you fill it up, depending on the number of players, you will go ahead and move on to the next row. But first, you have to measure your strength of your walls and your soldiers in order to defeat those pirates. If you cannot protect your city from the pirates, then you will lose a cannon. Every time you lose a cannon, you're going to lose five points at the end of the game. So one of the cool things about St. Malo is that it allows players to be creative because you can draw however which way you want. You're trying to gain points by adding in all these cool things into your city. However, you cannot forget about those pirates. Part of the game is defending against those pirates, and if you forget about them, you're going to lose major points. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again next time. Bye! Now, some of you are probably thinking at this point in time, I am tired of hearing about the Essen Fair. And that makes sense to some degree, but the fact is, folks, is that we are taking a look here at board games. That's what our show is about. We're talking all about new board games and things like that. And Essen is a huge convention for board gaming. See, Gen Con is, a, is as big as Essen is, if not bigger. The fact is, though, is that Gen Con focuses on board games, miniature games, role-playing games, collectible card games like Magic and things like that, Ro you know, cosplay. There's a lot of things. Essen has that other stuff. They have a little bit of comics, a little bit of role-playing, a little bit of collectible card games, but it's like 90... 9% board games. And while Gen Con has many huge games released there, like over 100 games, Essen has over 500. They're, they have a, a much bigger number than that that they, that they say, but in reality, about 500 new games. But that's mind-blowing. How many games are there? And it is a ton of fun to go there, but it's a very different convention than you've probably been to if you've been to American conventions or other conventions where there's not as much game playing. Well, there is at booths. People sit down and they, they play the whole game. You line up, get in there, get a table, and start demoing games, and you'll play through the whole game. But people go there to buy. When people come through on Thursday, they are bringing carts and suitcases, and it is not unheard of for people to tell me that they bought 50 to 100 games at a time. There are games everywhere. This year, the Essen Halls got bigger. They had Hall 6, 7, like they did last year, but 7 was slightly small, uh, was slightly smaller this year. 7 was completely full, and they added Hall 8, which was so big it even took up part of Hall 9. Um, it was just a huge event. Several of the booths of the big publishers got bigger. Fantasy Flight slash Asmodee specifically had a booth that looked like it could be at PAX or at uh, E3. Just huge displays and video displays and um, the um, Twitch was there and they were showing off things, which is this huge production. And, the, and there was many, many, many used game sales people there, people selling new games. So there was a lot to buy. It was a, a lot of fun uh, to go to, but you go there to buy all these games, just so many. Now this presents uh, both a wonderful thing, all these games, and a problem, because it's great to have all these games, but how do you know which ones to get? And this is kind of something that we're, we're going to run into more and more as time goes by. There's literally thousands of games that come out each year, and there are hundreds of games that people will tell you are amazing. Even us, we'll do our top 10 of the year later, uh, later on in December, and... That's a big deal, right? You know, these are the these are the games we think are the top ten, but we're gonna all think different things. And other people are gonna tell you that our choices are crazy, and these are the top tens because there are that many good games. And when you go, it's just kind of like, what do I do? And not only that, if a game is slightly old, people aren't as interested in it. There was one publisher telling me at their booth at Essen that the game had come out three months ago at Gen Con, so people were saying, oh, that's not a new game, and moving on. And that's just that's crazy to me. People are going around looking what's new, what's new, what's new, what's new, what's new. What's new. So there definitely is a bit of that at Essen, this, this, this running around, this consumerism. But that's not all that's at Essen. Essen is a really entertaining time. One of the things for me personally that I like about Essen is the globalization and the fact that I've met people from so many countries. Let's see if I can, I mean, I, I definitely talk to folks from Japan and Korea, China, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, um, Macedonia, Greece. Obviously, Germany, Belgium, France, Italy, Spain, 
Russia, Serbia, uh, Lithuania, um, Italy, uh, Israel, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, the, um, wow, I mean, and the Canada, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain. I mean, and this is just a smattering. There's, there's more I'm missing, right? The, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and, and this is Poland, Czech Republic. I mean, there's just so many, and I love that part, right? I love meeting people from all over the world uh, who are, are there because they love board games, and it's so much fun talking to people and discussing differences between cultures, and, and you see there, there's booths from everywhere. Like this year, there was an Indonesian booth. I hadn't seen uh, games from Indonesia before, so that was really neat to, to see these, these new not new countries, but to board gaming, kind of a new thing as they come with all kinds of cool games. And so I think that's that's probably my favorite part of Essen. Also, everyone's just so friendly there. We do shows at lots of conventions, but it's really hard to top our live show that we do at the Essen Fair. The, peop- the, the, the audience is so into the, the show. They have so much fun, and it's just fun to... But not just that... Just being out and with everybody and, and, and people come by the booths, just very friendly. It is a fantastic time for us. We had a really great this time this year at the Dice and Mystics event. It was really nice because one of the worst things about Essen for us is how exhausting it is. The convention goes from 10 to 7, but I'm usually there at 8, so I'm running 11-hour days. And then when we are done at 7, you're not done at 7 anyway. you got to clean up and everything. So we get out of there by 7.30. Then we go to dinner, and dinners in, in Germany are often quite lengthy. So we're down at 10, 30, 11 at night, go back to the hotel at 12, get up at 6, and just keep going. That's fun. It's good. It's neat. I'm not complaining, but it does make it a very tiring thing, especially when you have jet lag going. So the Dice and Mystics event, where we went to a local parish and just sat down with 100 other people and played games, was so relaxing and so fun for me. and just I just had a great time, and I hope to do that next year. There are a lot of great games at Essen. You might want to say, what is the game of the show? I don't know. Ataplano was obviously one that people really were running for. It sold out quickly. But then Azul sold 2,000 copies. 2,000. There are many, most publishers who, if their game sells 2,000 copies ever, are very happy to sell 2,000 at a convention. Plan B Games was having a good day. I know that Pandemic Legacy too. I mean, there were sold out things everywhere and I know that people brought in hundreds and thousands of copies. That's that's just insane to me. The board game business is certainly thriving and I look forward to seeing where it goes in the future. Well, uh, that's kind of just a short summary of Essen. Uh, when Eric and I later this week, well, not later, I guess it's tomorrow, I'll do Dice Tower tonight. We'll talk a little bit more about it. We'll also be doing a back talk on the subject and so on. So I'm sure you'll hear more about it, but it is important to the hobby. And I think it, there's a lot of great things that we're seeing come out of it. So if you're ever in Europe or you ever have a chance to cross there in Germany and you get a chance to go to Essen, it certainly is a spectacle to go see. And I'm really excited about the games that are coming from it in the future. Hey there, my name is Niels from the best and the worst actually from Silver Splashpeed, but my segment here is the best and the worst and you know that. Anyway, let's take a closer look to one of the old favorites of mine, the game. But hey, what's that? The Game Extreme. My favorite part on The Game Extreme is simply that you can play it as The Game Extreme or as the regular game. Simply ignore the seven new symbols if you wanted to play it as a regular game. And if you wanted to have a a more challenging, higher competition, you simply add these seven symbols to the game and create extreme out of it. The worst part is the flip side. If you already own the game, there is truly no real need for the game extreme, except you need more challenge. If you find the other, the basic game, too easy, play it with extreme. But there are other rules, so instead of playing two cards from your hand down, you can also add play three cards. That makes the game even more harder than the seven symbols. However, I pretty enjoyed the seven new symbols and I would say if you don't own the game already then buy the blue version instead of the red version. You get simply two in one. 
Yeah, that was my favorite part of the Game Extreme and also the worst part of Game Extreme from NSV. See you next week here on the Board Game Breakfast. Tom, take over, please. Hi, everyone. It is day three of Essen. And I am from the Netherlands and I live in Germany and I talk a lot of English. And there are some stuff in the language that in my mind, oh, it's just there. But some of the words are very similar and some of them are very different. If you take, for example, when you go and eat, you use a knife and a fork. In German, you would have a messer and a gabel. And then you have the Dutch, and they take one of the Germans and one word of the English. So you have a mess, like messer in German, and we would have a fork, a fork, like a English fork. Oh man, languages are great, isn't it? One of the big things I taught all the Americans when they got here, Essen in German is food. So in this week I am playing a game that is all about food. This week I am playing Kitchen Rush. In Kitchen Rush players work together to get the most prestige points making people happy with their orders in their restaurant. It is a worker placement game where the players take actions that are needed to make the customers happy and pay. After orders are taken all the ingredients are taken from storage, spices are added, meals are cooked and then served. There are some more actions that can be taken, like when the storage is empty, you need to go shopping or when there are no more uh, clean plates, then someone has to go to the sink and do the dishes. Now, the cool thing about Kitchen Rush is all the workers are sand timers and once you put them on a spot, you turn in the sand timer and you can take that action for as long as you want, but you can only make that worker do something else once the sand timer has run out. You have two of those and you're working in total on another time pressure, four minutes per round. Getting everything to work is, well, challenging. At the end of the round, all the workers need to be paid and prestige points are awarded. It may take some time for your group to get your kitchen going, but once it runs smoothly, Kitchen Rush is really an exhilarating game. Me and my family are happy to explore more of Kitchen Rush. My name is Dave Luza. Thanks for watching. Hi, Michael Isio from Solo Mode Games. We're getting close to Halloween and this is the time of year when a lot of people think about playing some scary board games. There's not a whole lot better than getting a group of friends together, setting the right atmosphere, maybe dimming the lights, playing some spooky music, and having a horror themed board game to bring everything together. However, maybe you can't get a group together and you're looking for some solo scares. I've got a couple of ideas that might work for you. Number one, Mansions of Madness, second edition. Uh, with this second edition, you actually can play this horror-themed game solo. The app basically works as your game master. Uh, but maybe you don't have three and a half hours to spare, but you want to get that Cthulhu itch scratched. In that case, you can look towards Fate of the Elder Gods. This is a game set in that same uh, Lovecraft Cthulhu mythos, but plays in a considerably shorter period of time. Still a lot of fun. If you want to go even shorter than that, you could look at The Bloody Inn. The Bloody Inn is a macabre game where you play uh, owners of a hotel and you are trying to kill different guests to gain their money and trying to dispose of the bodies without getting caught. Uh, definitely a horror themed game, something suitable for Halloween. And then finally, uh, an older title but a classic is Ghost Stories. As the name might imply, this is dealing with ghosts where you are Taoist monks trying to protect a village, keep it from getting haunted by an ever-increasing horde of ghosts. Um, probably the scariest thing about this game besides the theme is how hard it is. I have never won ghost stories, and I've tried many times. Uh, so there you have it. There's some solo scares that might work for you. Um, as you can see, I went all out for my costume for this edition. Have you figured out uh, who I am yet? I'm an alpha gamer, of course. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.
my name is Colin and I'm going to be talking about board games. Um, you can play with your family, it's fun, it's, and um, all that kind of stuff. Maybe just like play games, play some children games with adults and then the children might think it's fun. Then you just say to them, you might lose, might um, win next time. Might win next time, and the other person might lose. The map. Yeah, I'm happy playing anything. No. Um, sometimes I don't think of it, but if I did, then probably. Never have too many ball kittens. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> I've got an answer for all these questions. You have, you're really good. <laughs> and that's it for another board game breakfast. Slightly shorter this week, folks. I apologize about that because just different people going to different conventions. The Brawling uh, Brothers went to uh, the Unrivaled tournament, so you'll be seeing stuff from that. You know, there's just a lot of stuff coming. It's going to be a crazy two months now. November, December, so much to talk about, so many games. Ooh, why am I here? I'm going to play games and uh, eat some candy, maybe trick or treat. Yay. See you guys next time. I'm Tom Vassell. This has been Board Game Breakfast.